Okay. Um, can you hear me? Is that working? Hello, testing. Is that working? Hello. Okay, it's working. Okay, so my name is uh, Justin, and I'll be talking about um, phase zero, specifically uh, the, the spec of phase zero. And even more specifically, I'm going to try and, and give you a, a deep, deep dive into the, the objects that we are uh, building uh, that are part of the, the beacon chain. So uh, what is phase zero? Uh, phase zero is the, the beacon chain, is this kind of hub in a hub and spoke model. It's the, the system chain for Ethereum 2.0. It has no user transactions. And you can kind of think of it as a voting machine. So it's a, a place where we organize the voters that we call validators, and we process the votes, which are called uh, attestations. And uh, we do this in an incentive-compatible way uh, with rewards uh, and penalties. And then uh, phases one and two, which I, I won't talk about today, is, is the shards. So phase one is the, the, the data layer for the shards, and then uh, phase two is uh, why, where you add a notion of state and the notion of, of, of execution. Uh, yeah. So today is the focus is on, on, on phase zero, which is the, the one piece of Ethereum 2.0 where the spec is relatively mature. So um, in Ethereum 2.0, we have uh, this notion of discrete time, which we call slots. And slots are six seconds. So uh, time progresses from left to right. And in each slot, we can have uh, you know, one block. So there's one uh, well-defined block proposer who's invited to make one block. And usually, there will only be um, one block, because if, if a block proposer makes two blocks, then they get slashed. Um, and then some slots, you know, they can be empty, but that's fine. You know, the, the beacon chain just keeps on going. And then eventually, you kind of start building this blockchain. And you know, for every block, we have a, a, the state that advances. So here, you know, there's nothing, nothing new here. The beacon chain is a blockchain. And then we have this. Straight state transition, which is um, basically what the spec describes. So 95% of the spec is telling you how does this state transition work. The last little bit, the 5%, is going to be the so-called fork choice rule. So the, the, the state transition tells you how the blockchain advances in time. And the fork choice rule tells you if you have multiple forks, how do you collapse them to one canonical uh, chain. So you know, this is the object of study in the context of the, the abstract spec. We have a, a pre-state and a block. And then from these two things, we want to compute a post-state. And the, both the states, the triangles and the blocks, are well-defined uh, objects with a well-defined type. And a lot of what I'll be spending my time on today is describing what are in these things concretely. Um, <laughs> But before I, I dive into these two key objects, the state object and the uh, block object, I kind of want to give you a little bit of background on objects in general. Like, what do we mean by objects? How do we define them? How do we merkleize them, serialize them, et cetera? OK, so let's, let's go into the, uh, the background on objects. So the way we build objects is that we start with so-called uh, basic types. So we only have three basic types. It's a, very clean, very simple. Uh, we just have a UN64 where we do all the arithmetic. It's unsigned. Um, we serialize it using a little endian uh, serialization, eight bytes. Then we have uh, bytes. Uh, so we use this, for example, for, for hashes or, or blobs of data. We also use it for uh, pub keys and signatures, you know, which are just kind of raw bytes. And then we have uh, the Boolean, which uh, we just use for, for flags. And then from these three basic types, we will start building more complex types uh, with uh, so-called composite types. And there's also three here, very simple. So you, we have the notion of a container, which is uh, a bit like a, 
an ob like a JavaScript object where you have um, uh, key, key value pairs. Uh, and uh, the values don't have to be uh, homogeneous. So you can kind of, if you have an object, for example, a, a block object, well, you can put all sorts of different things in there. And that would be a container. It's, uh, it has a well-defined size. And we use the, the, the curly uh, braces notation. We have tuples, which is uh, basically an array, a uh, fixed size array. Um, the elements need to be homogeneous. And then we have lists, which is basically the same thing as a tuple, but the, the size could be a variable size. So if you want to build an object, at the very bottom, you have these basic types. And then you can build, for example, lists of UN64s. And then you can do lists of lists, and et cetera. Um, so semantically, uh, we, we, we use a lot of, uh, of, of UN64s. Uh, so we have uh, slots, epochs, shards, index, amount. Time. We, we try to use UN64s everywhere we do. Uh, we use ar arithmetic, and that, uh, that's kind of very nice because it, it's very simple. Um, now, one thing to, to mention here maybe is that the, the amounts that we denominated uh, that we denominate are, are, in, are in GUI. So that's uh, 1 billionth of an ether, and 64 bits is enough to basically represent any balance. Um, and this, the timestamp is, is basically seconds. So we use uh, Unix timestamps. So the, the notion of epoch, I haven't talked about that. It's basically uh, 64 slots. And the index, I mean validator index. So in, in, the, in the registry of, of validators, uh, every validator will have a well-defined index. And then in, in, when we look at bytes, we have uh, you know, hashes and, and, and roots. So roots will be kind of Merkle roots. We have pub keys, signatures, bit fields, and flags. And that's, that's the bulk of, uh, of like the, the, the basic objects we'll be working with. And then we'll be building even more complex objects with these basic things. OK, so now let's talk about uh, Merkleization. You have an object. How do you Merkleize it? So Merkleize it means um, kind of building a Merkle tree and getting, getting a root. Sorry. OK, yes. Um, so wh why do we want to Merkleize objects? So one reason to Merkleize objects is to get a, a unique identifier for every, every object. And the other reason why Merkle, uh, Merkleizing is, is a kind of a, a nice data structure is that you can prove kind of inclusion of a specific field. So you have a, a huge object, you know, which could be like a, close to a gigabyte, and you want to prove that one specific element is part uh, of your object. And you build this Merkle path from the, from the field to the root. Um, and then you know, it has all these nice properties about updating the, uh, the object. So if you, if you change one field element, you don't have to rehash everything. Uh, you, just, you just have to update the Merkle path. Anyway, so for Merkleization, we need the, the basic uh, cryptographic primitive that we need is the hash function. We have, uh, for example, SHA-256. We, we're kind of constrained with two choices in, in phase uh, zero, either SHA-256 or KCHAC-256. And the reason is that Ethereum 1, that's the only two hashes that are well supported natively uh, right now. Um, you know, we, we'll, we'll see which one we'll, we'll pick in the end. OK, so before I talk about object Merkleization, um, let, let me talk about the Merkleization of just uh, bytes, like chunks of bytes. So a chunk is, let's say, 32 bytes. And if I have these chunks of bytes, if I want, and I want to Merkleize, I just add a little bit of padding until I get a power of 2. So 4 is a power of 2. And then I can start Merkleizing, and I get a root. So no, nothing new here. OK, so now let's talk about uh, basic object packing. So I have these, uh, these UNs, for example, and I have uh, five of them. Uh, what I do is that like, each uint is, is 8 bytes. So I'm going to uh, pack them as much as possible in, in a single in, in chunks. And you know, you, there might be this overflow. So the fifth one kind of is overflowing the chunk. That's not a problem. I add a little bit of padding to the last chunk. And that's, that's my packing function. So that's just a helper to explain how the Merkleization works. And then the final helper that we have is the kind of mixed in length. So 
uh, let's say that we have a, a list of variable of variable length, and we want uh, we, ha we we've done an initial Merkleization, but we want to include the length in the Merkle root. Well, that's not a problem. We just take the 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 root, we take the length, and then we we do one extra layer of hashing, and we get the new root. And the reason why we want to include the the length of um, lists in <coughs> uh, when we serialize is that one we want to be able to uh, if we if we don't know the number of elements we want to be able to distinguish um, kind of padding from zero elements so the, the padding just looks like zero bytes and we want to make sure that the padding is is not con you know interpreted as as elements and we also want to know um, how how deep the the, the Merkle branches should be. So we don't want to confuse, for example, an intermediate node in a, in a uh, Merkle tree as an element. We only want to consider the, the leaves as, as real elements. OK, and then uh, this is how we do Merkleization. So um, <clears throat> there's basically four different options. If you have a, 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 a basic object or a basic tuple or basic list, so uh, something that kind of built out of these uh, these basic types, then all you do is that you, you pack and you Merkleize. So you pack into chunks and you Merkleize. That's all you do. It's very simple. And if, and if you have um, one of these more composite objects, what you do is that you recursively Merkleize the elements. You get these roots. And then each root can be interpreted as a chunk because it's 32 bytes. And then you Merkleize again. Um, so very, very simple object Merkleization. And the, the, the final thing is that if you have a list, which is the variable size thing, then you want to mix in the length. Um, and and that, is, that is all you need to do. OK, so that's, that's Merkleization. It's very simple, very nice. And it's part of the what we call a simple serialized spec. So uh, when you. That's kind of the, the standard that is used for the, the various clients to communicate with each other. And then the final thing I want to mention in this kind of background on objects is how we do signatures. So if we have a, a container uh, which needs to be signed, then we have the notion of a self-signed container. A self-signed container has its own signature in the object. Now, a signature cannot sign over itself. That would be kind of a, a recursive thing. So what we do is that we remove the signature as step number one, if you want to verify the signature. Two, we compute the root without the signature. And three, we check that the signature matches against the root. It's very simple and kind of as a, as a convention that we use in the phase zero spec, but you don't necessarily have to use it everywhere, is to have the signature be the, the last field. Uh, so, for example, the object that's being signed here is a block header, um, and uh, that will be one of the objects that is signed by the block proposer, and that will have to be verified. Okay, any any questions so far before uh, moving into the state object? So, you know, this was just background on objects, and and you know, the state object is where the fun really starts, and uh, we get really concrete as to. What what the, the what's in the spec? Okay, so uh, let's look at the state object. Okay, so this is the full state object. Um, <coughs> it, you know, it might look a bit scary at first. It uh, it has 29 fields, so about 30 fields, and you can kind of do this uh, semantic batching of the fields. So you have these these seven categories, you know, versioning roots, etc. Um, and so what, what, I, what I'd like to do is kind of go through every, every field and, and, and tell you about it and hopefully give you a bit of, um, of intuition as what's going on. And this kind of, this, this hand-holding will hopefully help you to uh, read the spec if, you, if you're not already familiar with it. Okay, so versioning. So, we have uh, three different fields here. The first one is the uh, genesis time. So we, the way that the, the beacon chain is, is, is created is that we have uh, the Ethereum 1 chain, which 
allows for deposits of Ether um, into the Ethereum 2 chain. And the way that it works here is that you, you, you send Ether into this uh, burner contract, which creates uh, a de deposit receipt, which can be consumed by the Ethereum 2 chain. And once you have enough of these receipts, and specifically once you have 2 million Ether, then you can, you can start the staking process. So um, the, the Ethereum 2, 2 chain will, 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 will start its, its life once we have 2 million Ether. And uh, the, the genesis time is kind of uh, scheduled to be at midnight, uh, UTC. And it, it's, uh, it's scheduled to uh, have at least one, one day of uh, security margin after we've reached the two Ether. And the, the reason is that we don't want to have multiple Genesis uh, events. We want to have a, a single clean Genesis event for Ethereum 2. Um, and so we, we wait for lots of confirmations on ETH1 to make sure that we have a single one. Uh, one like, kind of interesting quirk here is that the timestamp is Unix time. And so uh, sorry, that's for the next. Uh, OK, slots. So slots is you know, this discrete notion of time, six seconds. It progresses. We also have the notion of epoch, which is 64 slots. So if you want the epoch number, what you do is you just take slot and divide by 64. Uh, and one interesting thing about slots here is that it's in, in Unix time, which means that it has leap seconds. So um, technically, uh, OK, that's much, much better for the sound. Thank you. Um, technically, you. You can have slots which are five seconds or seven seconds, depending on the on the leap seconds. Uh, and then we have the the notion of a fork. So here, this is kind of a versioning at the at the social layer in terms of doing hard forks. So we have kind of this this native mechanism, which is very nice nice if you want to do a fork. And the, what the fork uh, specifies is number one, the the previous version of the fork and, and, and the, the, the current version. And one of the things that we do is um, that we do uh, signature, there's a little bit of echo. So we have this uh, domain isolation uh, with the signature. So when, when, you, when you sign a message, that's going to be relative to a fork. And so that gives us uh, native replay protection against uh, possible fork forking events on Ethereum 2.0. OK, um, let's look at the, the roots. So here there's uh, nothing, uh, you know, nothing groundbreaking. We have uh, the, the, the beacon chain keeps track of its own uh, uh, block roots. Uh, part of the reason there is that it wants to expose them um, in, in the shards. Uh, because the shards will, will probably want to use them. It also exposes the state roots. Um, you know, one question you might ask is, isn't you know, the block roots sufficient? Um, well, the answer is that blocks only come you know, when they come. And uh, we want kind of full granularity of the state, so we, 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 we put uh, state roots at, at every single slot. And then we have this, um, this kind of really cool uh, data structure, which is the, the historical roots which is very simple. And basically, it, it allows you to, um, <clears throat> to prove that some, his, some state root or some block root was a given value at some point in, in the past. So, so you see there's this kind of separation between the, the recent stuff. We, we, we're keeping the, the latest 8,000 uh, block and state roots, and then there's the historical stuff. And the way that we build the historical roots is that we, we take the, the block and the state roots, and every 8,000 blocks, we merkleize them, and we include one root in the, his, the, the, the root of that in the historical root. And so basically, this, this data structure only grows by 32 bytes, one hash, every 8,000 uh, slots, and so it's, it grows extremely slowly. And then the, the latest, uh, the other relevant uh, thing in the roots is the, the latest block header. So we, one of the things that we want is the, when, a, when the block arrives on, on, the, on the, we want to check 
that its uh, previous uh, block root matches uh, the, the actual previous block root. Unfortunately, the, 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 previous, um, <coughs> the previous block root is, is part of the header, which itself has the state root. And so because the state can't refer to its own state root, that would be kind of a circular dependency, what we do is that we, uh, we actually remove the state root. We kind of we, we blank it out. Um, but that's fine, because on the, on, the, on the next lot, you can kind of recompute the, 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 the previous block header, compute the, the block root for, the, for that, and then check that the, the, the previous block root kind of points to the right thing. OK, so this is a bit of technic technicality. It doesn't really matter. OK, um, if one. So you know, as I mentioned, we're using if one to do the economic bootstrapping of if two, and we use these uh, deposits from if one to if two. And so at the very least, the Ethereum two chain needs to be aware of the Ethereum one chain. And what we do here is that we have um, <clears throat> the notion of if one data. So if one data is going to be the, a, a block hash um, that is pointing to an, basically a, a, a recent block hash in Ethereum 1 land. And it's also going to have a deposit root. So the deposit root is going to be the Merkle tree of all the deposits that have been made up to that point in, in, the, <coughs> uh, in the deposit contract. And so the, the way that we have the Ethereum 2 chain be aware of the Ethereum 1 chain is using a so-called you know, if one voting committee. So we have um, a, a thousand uh, block proposers that are invited to vote on what they think is the tip of the if one. And if sufficiently many of these proposers agree on what the tip is, then that is what we dictate is, is the tip. And this, this is handled by the, the vote. So basically, every time a new block comes in, uh, that's, that's casting a new vote for what the Ethereum data is. And if you reach the, the, the threshold, which is, uh, in this case, one half, uh, then you basically update the, the latest ETH1 data. And having this, uh, as, I said, as I mentioned, having this, uh, the Ethereum 2 chain aware of the Ethereum 1 chain is going to be required to process the deposit. <clears throat> and we also store the latest deposit index. And the reason why we have that um, is because we want to process the deposit uh, um, in order. And we also want to force the, the validators to actually uh, process deposits if there are deposits to be, to be processed. OK, so this is kind of the, the heart, probably, of the beacon chain. This is the, the validator registry. So as I mentioned, the beacon chain is this voting machine. And we have this registry, effectively, of voters, which are the validators. Um, and uh, let's have a look at uh, what it means to be a validator. So to be a validator, you, you, um, it, it means uh, so we have these seven fields uh, for, for validators. And you know, validators are, are such an important object that I'm, I'm going to do a, a deep dive into those specifically. OK, so in a validator, the first two fields are going to be the pub key and the withdrawal credentials. So in a way, here we have two separate pub keys, two identities per validator. We have the, the pub key, which is going to be your day-to-day your -day signing key. So if you want to sign a, a vote, an attestation, or sign a block, or sign a transfer, or whatever, you will use, um, actually not a, not a transfer, uh, block um, or attestation, you will use your pub key. And then anytime you want to withdraw money out of the system, we have a separate key, and the, which we call kind of the, the withdrawal key that is uh, hidden uh, in the withdrawal credentials, the withdrawal credentials being the hash of this of this withdrawal key. And the reason we have it is because the pub key, as a validator, you will, it, it will be a hotkey. So you need to be online, and you need to be signing the messages online. 
And we don't, in, if your computer is hacked as a validator, we won't, don't want you to lose all your money. So we have a separate key which you can keep in, in cold storage and you only use it for withdrawal events. And these two fields are basically specified in the, the deposit transaction that you make on Ethereum 1 to the deposit contract. So once you made the, the deposit, you eventually become registered once this if one process works. And then if your balance is greater than or equal to 31, 32 ETH, you get activated. And what does it mean to get activated? It, only, it, it basically means that your, your, your activation ep epoch is less than or equal to the, the current epoch. And then um, you have the ability to exit the system. So if uh, you know, voting on Ethereum 2.0 is not your thing and you want to leave, uh, then you, you can exit. And you can issue a so-called voluntary exit message. But there's, uh, there's actually two other ways that you can exit, uh, which are non-voluntary, which are forced. Uh, one is through uh, an ej ejection. So if your balance gets too low and kind of gets dangerously low, then we'll just kick you out uh, automatically. Um, and if you do something which is kind of provably bad in the voting process, and I'll talk about the various slashing conditions, there's only three of them, um, then that will also force an exit on you. And so we have this notion of uh, active validators. So the set of active validators are those that are kind of active at the present moment. And the way that you check you, the set of va active validators is you just go through the whole registry and you check that the current epoch is between the activation epoch and the exit epoch. And then once you've exited, you have to wait a little bit and then you're, you're withdrawable and you can, you can uh, send your money uh, out of the beacon chain. And then we have these two flags, that are just helper flags. Number one is uh, basically specified if, you, if you've made a voluntary exit or not. Uh, and two, it specifies whether you've been slashed or not. Um, the reason why we have the voluntary exit is because if you do a voluntary exit, we kind of want to queue, queue the voluntary exit so that people don't leave the beacon chain too fast. And that's helpful for, for light clients and kind of a weak subjectivity. So we want the, the set of uh, valid, the active validators to remain roughly constant over time, over, let's say, a, a period of, of four months. And so we have uh, this, this queuing mechanism so that not everyone can leave at the same time. And we have the slashed uh, flag because if you've been slashed, then we want you to, to receive the, the, the slashing penalty, which uh, is going to depend on, on other people being slashed. Uh, I'll talk about that later. OK, so we have the, the registry. And then an, another important aspect of the registry, which for technical reasons is kept separate, is all the balances. So um, <clears throat> we have one balance uh, per validator. And the reason why we've separated the registry from the balance is merely an optimization. So the registry almost never changes. So you know, the pub key never changes, the withdrawal credentials never change, and the, the activation epoch is kind of a one-time thing, similar for the exit epoch. Um, so this. The, the registry doesn't change that much. On the other hand, the balances, they change at every single epoch because every single validator will get like a micro incentivization, like a micro reward or a micro penalty. <clears throat> and so this, this balances uh, structure is gonna change a lot. There's gonna be a lot of churn and we're gonna have to rehash it. And so to have less hashing overhead, we separate out the two. It's just a technicality. Um, we, also have, we also keep track of the validator registry update epoch. So when was the registry uh, last updated? Mostly a technicality here because the reason why we have it is that um, we have this uh, exponential back off uh, um, uh, mechanism, which is a, a security mechanism if uh, if finality doesn't happen often enough. Anyway, uh, let, let's just skip that. And then we have the uh, active index route. So for, for the purposes of uh, light clients, as, as a light client, okay, so let, let's briefly talk about light clients. How do they work? So 
a lab client is a client that is aware of the state of the beacon chain without having to run all the transactions. And the way that it works is that you have a, a trusted set of active validators at time t, and then you want to know um, what the set of active uh, validators is at t plus, let's say, nine days. And uh, the way we, we do that is that we ask the active validator set from nine days ago to vote on what they think is the, the active validator set today. And so you can do these big jumps kind of from checkpoints, nine days separated, separated nine days uh, from each other. Um, and it, it, this uh, active index route is basically the, the validator registry filtered to just the active validators, and that's, that's what's useful for, for light clients. OK, shuffling. So now that we have this uh, validator, it's very important for security purposes that we shuffle the validator um, set. Uh, and so this is the, what we have in the state to, to support that. The most important of these uh, fields is the first one, the, the latest uh, Randall mixes. And it basically keeps track of the last 8,000 Randall mixes. Um, we also have the, uh, the, 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 the shuffling seeds. So basically, so I'll, I'll talk about the Sorry, I'll talk about the random mixes uh, later on uh, because it's quite important. We, we also keep track of the, 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 the seed, um, <clears throat> which is basically going to be the, the specific random mix that we use to shuffle. OK, so let me, talk, let me talk about the shuffling function. So we have this seed, which is going to be a random mix, which I'll explain later. And we have the set of validators. And we want to shuffle them. OK, so uh, what, what kind of properties do we want from the, the, the shuffle function? Number one, we want it to be a, a pseudo random permutation. So, permutation here is quite important. It means that every validator uh, gets assigned uh, to, <coughs> uh, to one, uh, one unique place. Um, and locally comp uh, computable means that uh, if, you, if you take a, a specific validator, you want to uh, be able to, to compute where it's been assigned to uh, without having to compute the, the permutation on, on the whole validator set. Um, and we have this, this really nice uh, shuffling function, which is called swap or not, and I'll just uh, briefly show you how it works because it's actually super simple. So let's say you have this um, the set of validators, active validators, 1 through n. These are the, the indices, and you want to shuffle them. What do you do? Number one, you pick a, um, a random pivot. So that's going to be a, a random number uh, between 1 and n based on your seed. And then you're going to build these pairs around the, the, the pivot. Um, and then for each pair, you're going to pick uh, a random uh, bit. It's going to be 0 or 1. And you ca you can, this, this random bit can be uh, locally computable, because what you do is you, ju you just take the position of the bit, uh, and then you hash it with the seed. And you, you can get this one bit kind of for, for a position that's, that's somewhere, somewhere in between without having to compute everything. And then when the bit is 1, you will swap the, the, the two elements. And if the bit is 0, you don't swap. So it's called swap or not, because either you swap or you don't swap. Um, and then you just repeat this process 90 times. So cryptographers have proven that this is a, a, a pseudo-random permutation, meaning that the permutation <laughs> that you get after doing this looks like a random permutation. So this is what we want. Um, it's it's a permutation in the first place because um, if you want to compute the, the, the reverse, you, you just do the, the, the 90 rounds in reverse. So like the, the reverse operation of a swap is itself. 
Um, and if you didn't do any swap, then you know, that's, that's already its own inverse. <coughs> and the reason why it's uh, locally computable is because each bit here is locally computable. Anyway, so once we have uh, the active validator set and we have the seed from Randall and we have the shuffling function, we can take, take the shuffled active validators and we can kind of slice it up. So what, what we do here is that we do slicing uh, vertically in, in slots, in the 64 slots. Um, that's kind of to spread the load over time. The validator set could be enormous. You know, we could have a, a million validators. Um, and so we want to spread the load a little bit over time. And we do um, <coughs> slicing uh, horizontally, uh, basically uh, in such a way that we have exactly uh, 1,024 committees. And the reason why we want 1,024 committees is that we want one committee per shard. Um, and the reason why we want one committee per shard is that we want to, to take this, this committee and assign them some task in a shard. And this is, this is how we get scaling, by the way. So this is how sharding works. The basic idea of sharding is that we move away from the model where every validator does uh, all the work that has to be done. You know, for example, in, in if one, every node does all the computations. Instead, we take the, the, the pool of validators, we slice it and dice it, and then we assign these very small committees to, uh, to specific shards to do some work. Um, and each validator will kind of get one single vote per epoch. Um, OK. And, and here, here's the, the, the explanation as to why the, the idea of having committees works. Um, basically, we have this honesty assumption. So in, in the pool, they're very similar to Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, you know, we assume, let's say, that 51% of the miners are honest. Well, in Ethereum 2.0, we have a, kind of a slightly stronger assumption. We assume that two-thirds uh, of the validators are honest. Um, and we have this massive pool, which could be, for example, a million validators. And we, with this sampling mechanism, this, this shuffling and dicing, we get much smaller committees, you know, on the order of, let's say, 1,000 validators. And if we have this two-thirds honesty assumption, then with extremely high probability, we will have at least one half of the committee which is honest. And you can use this basic fact to, to basically have a voting process where if at least half of the the validators agree on something, then this thing must be true, because there's at least one honest person who's voting on that. OK. Um, so the seed, the epoch, and the start shard are kind of three things that are required to determine this slicing and dicing uh, of, of the committees. The start shard is kind of a technicality. It has two purposes. Number one, it's um, to <clears throat> to add a little offset to the start chart so that you know within an epoch you you kind of uh, <clears throat> move around the the, the sh okay that's mind technicality uh, and we 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 store these triples seed epoch start chart for both the current epoch and the previous epoch uh, yeah. because we want to be able to recompute the set of val active validators relative to two different shufflings from the recent past. OK, whew. Um, finality. So uh, finality is this really nice uh, gadget uh, which, we, uh, which we have in Ethereum 2.0. And it's, it's, uh, it gives us the notion of um, <coughs> economic finality, which means that if, uh, if something goes really wrong, if you have two crosslinks, sorry, two finalized checkpoints which are inconsistent with each other, then you have a guarantee that a lot of money will be burnt. Specifically, one third of the active validators will get slashed. Um, and finality is uh, done using these, uh, these attestations, which are the, the votes. Um, and the, the one of the important things here for attestations is the notion of uh, aggregation. So, we, we have these uh, signatures called uh, BLS signatures, which are very friendly to aggregation. And specifically, if everyone is voting for the same thing, 
so you, everyone is signing for the same message, then you can just take the sum of these signatures and verify them as if they were one single signature as opposed to being you know, a thousand uh, signature. Then. And here you basically get a, a 1,000 fold increase in scalability. So one of the reasons uh, we have so many shards is, is thanks to this, uh, this trick of uh, BLS signatures. Anyway, the uh, attestation data is the important thing which uh, I'll dive in because it, it's just so important. So the attestation is the vote, right? I mentioned that the beacon chain is this voting machine. We have the voters that are the validators, and this is what they're voting for. Uh, and it turns out that the, the attestation, which is this meta vote, is extremely powerful because it contains three different types of subvotes inside it. So the first vote is going to be a vote for a single block root in your beacon chain. Uh, and that is important for uh, the, the fork choice rule. So the, the fork choice rule just basically um, assigns weights to every single block. And very similar to the, somewhat similar to, to the, the current fork choice rule in Ethereum 1 and in Bitcoin. Um, and uh, the, the reason <coughs> why we in include these, uh, this information on chain is because we want to do incentivization of the, co of the correct vote. So if people have indeed voted for the right block route, uh, by right I mean um, from the perspective, um, <coughs> from the perspective of, 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 a, of a chain, um, then, then you get a reward. If you, if you voted for a block route which is different than the current chain that you're currently looking at, then you get a penalty. Uh, we have uh, FFG votes, uh, which is for finality, and then you have these uh, cross-link votes, which is used for sharding. <coughs> so cross-links are basically the, the communication mechanism between, uh, between the shards. Uh, the beacon chain is, is aware of every shard uh, as a light client, and the, the cross-links are basically shard checkpoints that get included in the beacon chain. And to become a cross-link, you need to have the committee assigned to a shard agree uh, on, on, on the cross-link data route. OK, so I'll try to move faster because I don't have that much time. Uh, there's basically four uh, things that need to be uh, chosen when you vote, vote, and each thing uh, basically is, is, has a micro-incentivization. So if you vote for the right thing, you get a reward, and if you voted for the wrong thing, you, 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 you lose a little bit of money that gets burnt. Okay, so we have uh, justification, which is uh, <clears throat> basically the, uh, this, this mechanism to uh, <clears throat> to, uh, to where the, the whole set of validators tries to, um, <clears throat> to vote on, on, on what they think is, is the, the tip uh, of, the, of the beacon chain. And they, they do so with, this, uh, with these arrows from source to, to, to target. And basically, they, they try different things. And if, if they don't reach the two-third threshold, which is kind of this uh, enshrined two-third threshold in the in the protocol, then the, the arrow is, is dashed. And once you do reach the threshold, then you get a, a full arrow. Anyway, this is the, the justification process. Um, I'll skip over this. And then you have the fi finalization uh, uh, process, which is basically uh, pattern matching on, on the um, justification. So when you, when you have two red dots in a row, which is two justified um, <clears throat> epoch boundaries, then the first one is going to be deemed to be finalized. Um, and we, you know, I can skip over this, but basically we have a, a generalized uh, version of the finality gadget where we actually have two finality patterns, uh, and this is the other one. And then we have the crosslinks, uh, which is, as I mentioned, you have Every shard is assigned this very small committee, small relative to the total validator pool. They make these individual attestations. These attestations, if they're, if they're the same, they get aggregated. And then if you reach the two-third threshold, then you become a crosslink. 
Okay, and this is the very last field in the state object, thank God. Um, latest slash balances. So the idea here is called partial slashing. So if, you know, one of the things that we want to, uh, to encourage is to become a validator. And if there's some sort of software bug in, the, in an individual client, we, you know, we don't want that, that, that poor guy to get completely slashed and lose their, their 32 ETH. So we have this mechanism called partial slashing, which says that if there's some sort of isolated incident where you know, a few validators did something bad, but the rest of the validator set didn't do anything bad at all, then it's actually fine, because security is not compromised in, in any way. So we have a very small uh, penalty. If, on the other hand, a very large uh, portion of validators did uh, something slashable, then we consider this to be a real threat, and hence a real attack, and so we'll slash very heavily. And uh, the latest slash balances basically keeps track of how many of these slashing events have happened so that you can do the slashing proportional uh, to, to, to the recent past. OK. Um, I only have a few minutes, so, and I want to take a few questions. So I'll just uh, rush through the, 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 the block object. So this is the block object, uh, considerably simpler than the state object. And you have the, the header and the body. And within the body, you have these uh, two mandatory fields. Uh, one is used for randomness, the randar reveal. One is used for this uh, voting on if one. And then you have these uh, optional transactions, um, or operations, uh, as the, some people call them. Um, and basically, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just quickly go through them all. So actually, in, in the header here, there's, there's, there's nothing kind of uh, magical here. So we have the, the slot number, which is the versioning over time. We have the previous block route that allows us to build a blockchain, a chain of blocks. You have the state route, which is the post-state route. So every block computes a, uh, a corresponding state, hash uh, merkleizes it, and includes the route uh, in, the, in, the, in the header. We have the body, which is what's below, and the signature, which is the signature in the context of a self-signed container that I explained at the beginning. OK, so let's look at the, the, the body. So in the body, we have the Randall mix. This is really important. Uh, so the way that it works is that it's, it's a signature. It's a BLS signature. And the, the reason, so we used to have it, uh, we used to have a hash chain based uh, Randall, but now we've used to BLS signatures everywhere. And this is really, really cool because uh, it makes the, the phase zero spec 100% uh, MPC friendly. So MPC means uh, multi party computation, but specifically we want to be friendly to staking pools. So if you, if you can't afford 32 ETH and you still want to be a validator, well, you can put down, let's say, um, 10 ETH with uh, you know, three, three other people, and you, 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 get, you get your 32 ETH. Um, and you can have a two of three multi-sig mechanism. Um, and by removing the, 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 the secrets from the, the, the commit reveal um, uh, uh, previous design, now, now we have these signatures. And the, the, one of the cool things of BLS signatures is that they have the support for uh, you know, N of M uh, multi-sig out of the box. Um, so if you ha the, this, this, the random reveal is going to be the signature of the current epoch, which is something that is unpredictable to uh, everyone except the, the signer. So it's kind of local entropy that each signer is kind of sharing to the world, is revealing to the world. And what we do is that we hash the reveal, and then we XOR it with the the current so-called Randall mix. This is it's just one line of code, which is very nice. Um, and just the, the graphical version is that in one epoch, you have these 64 uh, block proposers. Each one of them has the option to either reveal or not reveal their local entropy. And then you just XOR everything. And so long as you have one single uh, reveal, which um, was not previously revealed, then this whole thing is unpredictable, which is what we want. OK, so you then uh, you know, we have this if one voting process. As I mentioned, you have uh, a committee of a, a, a thousand proposers, and they vote on what they think 
is the tip of ETH1. And then if you get this one half threshold, then um, uh, th that becomes the, 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 the root that ETH2 considers canonical. OK, transactions. Um, I think I'll, I'll just talk about them on this single slide because I don't have much time. So uh, we have two types of slashings, proposer slashing, attester slashing. Proposer slashing is super simple. It just says, as a proposer, I'm not allowed to make two proposals at the same slot. Uh, and that's kind of to, to minimize forking. Um, so normally, in every single slot, you should have just one single block. Attester slashing is basically the, um, the, <clears throat> the, the, the two slashing conditions in Casper FFG. One is called no double vote, and the one is called no surround. Um, and I'll, I'll share these slides so you can look at it. But one of the cool things is that with these two slashing conditions, you have safety. What does safety mean? It means that if there's a fork, see here there's a fork, um, and you have two finalized checkpoints, uh, like this one and this one, because they, they, they satisfy the finality pattern. Well, um, you, because of the no double vote, you can't have a <coughs> the, the target be any of these two um, crossed out uh, checkpoints. And because of the no surround, you cannot have this surrounding thing, because that would surround uh, the, the finality pattern uh, on top. And so there's, there's no way that you can kind of um, connect the dots, and so you have at least one third of the validators that gets slashed. Uh, attestations, basically, you know, these are the votes that need to get included on chain so that they can be processed. You have the deposits. Nothing really interesting here. I'll just skip over this. Voluntary exits, basically saying, I want to stop being a, a validator, so I leave the validator pool. And then transfers. This transfer is kind of interesting because um, for phase zero, we, <clears throat> um, you know, we have this one-way deposit from if one to if two, and there's no way to bring the if two back um, unless you sell it on an, on an exchange. And, and this is precisely what transfers allows. So it allows for uh, taking your balance as a validator and sending it to another validator, and that other validator could be like an exchange, and then that that will basically make if two liquid on the beacon chain before we have the shards where you will then be able to send your balance to. OK, whew. That, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that uh, that's basically mostly it. One last slide is that the good news is that in this, in this kind of uh, 50 minutes or whatever, I've covered 37% of the spec. <laughs> And uh, the reason is that so I, I, a few days ago, I posted this, uh, this challenge uh, to try and write the whole spec in Go in uh, 1,024 lines of code. Uh, and uh, Proto Lambda took the challenge and uh, basically wrote the whole thing in like three or four days, which is extremely impressive. Uh, I think this will be made public very soon. It's extremely readable, uh, probably more readable than the spec itself. Um, and this is going to be like the, this, the second, uh, well, one of two executable specs. So we have now the Go executable spec, which is this one. And we have the Python executable spec, which Vitalik just basically uh, did yesterday. And so we can uh, kind of get these uh, to, to uh, and compare them and try and find bugs. So this is, this is really exciting. Uh, thank you. I'll take a few questions if I have time. Yeah, I will tweet uh, these slides. Uh, so the question is, uh, where can I find the slides with, with all of this? The, the, sch the, the schemas. Yeah, so you, you can go uh, on the um, phase zero uh, spec. Just search for Ethereum phase zero spec, and you'll find it. It's on GitHub. And you have a question? Yes, here. Uh, I was wondering how are uh, a constants like the 2 million ETH um, uh, decided? How do we decide on having two, 2 million ETH to start the process? Yes, uh, like how are those constants uh, decided? Yeah, so these are constants that we can change. Um, 
kind of two million ETH is kind of uh, something we felt was uh, was was large large enough to 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 have a, a, a secure system. Um, you know, it would it would be very unfortunate if we had you know only you know half a million or whatever because it it would mean that the the beacon chain would be relatively easily uh, overtakeable. So uh, the main assumption that we have is that you know, no more than one third of the validators are dishonest. So if you only have, let's say, <clears throat> uh, you know, half a million ETH, then it only takes a few hundred thousand ETH to take over the beacon chain. So you know, Joe Lubin or whatever could just go ahead and do it. Any other question? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Sorry, um, just before everyone leaves, so we have an announcement for you. We, ha we are organizing a CTF competition during... Sorry, yeah. So we are organizing a CTF competition during uh, the HCC. It starts today. And it's organized by teams like Diligence, Trail of Bits, Kleros, and um, also Ledger. And so you can uh, check the ASEF Twitter to get information about where we 